Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Gromyko. I am from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We're the world's largest organization of residential and commercial properties, property inspectors. And essentially, we certify home inspectors all over the world. And today, we are doing a live class. It's online. It's free. Open to anyone. And we do them a lot. And um, the third URL there, that bottom link, takes you to the page where we have all of the recordings of all of our webinars. And we've been doing this for a few years now. So you can take a look at that. Um, if you wanted to contact me or anyone on staff, we're all located on that top link. That's natchi.org forward slash contact. And if you're looking for something and you can't find it, well, we tried to put everything on one page for you. And that's at natchi.org forward slash everything. And on that page is actually a 15-step checklist on how to, uh, for running, starting and running, operating a successful home inspection company. And I recommend everyone to go there. Um, Beginners and veteran inspectors, um, folks who are just starting out and inspectors who have been in the business. Um, we have a lot of tips there to boost your business. So today we're going to do a home inspection. Um, I did this home inspection on this home a few years ago. We're going to go over all the images and video and report uh, if we can get to it. And... Um, what I do is um, I inspect the roof first because that's my brand. And um, the brand is what distinguishes you from the rest of your competition. So it was just easy for me to start on the roof. You don't have to, there's no standard on what system you need to start with. But for me, I tend to get to the property early um, particularly if it's vacant, and I want to start. Um, I can do two a day, one at eight, one at 12, about three hours each, a little time in between for driving. I'm, be I'm home before five to see the kids and wife. Um, but you can do two a day that way, using a mobile device to inspect. So I get my ladder off my truck. I put it up to the roof, get on the roof, with my mobile device, I'm taking pictures with my camera, I'm taking videos with my other camera, and I'm using my mobile device to write my inspection report as I go. And that's how I can do two inspections a day. Now, about the roof. You, you are not required to walk upon any roof surface according to the standards of practice for home inspections. You are required to inspect the roof, but you can do it from the ground. You can use binoculars. Um, some inspectors are having fun with drones. Um, uh, InterNACHI's e-commerce partner, Inspector Outlet, has a really great device. It's called a spectroscope. It's a extendable pole with a camera on the top of it. It extends about 30 feet and has a wireless connection to your mobile device. And it takes images and video, and you can inspect the ground or the chimney. Uh, you can inspect the roof or the chimney um, from the ground safely. So don't go up any roof unless you're trained. So I was a home builder for a while, and so I get up on the roof. So there, there's my one minute disclaimer and warning. Don't get up on any roof. But if you do, what I do is uh, I take pictures of everything. So on the roof, I'll probably take about 100 pictures and video. And I take a picture of every roof surface, every plane, every field, every component. And I speak about the roof covering material. I don't talk about the roof system. I don't say things like the roof is in good shape. Um, I talk about the roof covering material. So that's really what I see. I can't see underlayment. I can't see the deck. I can feel the deck, the sheathing. Um, looking for flashing, can't see all the flashing, 
but I'm looking at the roof covering material, looking for obvious cracks and damage. And when I go up on the roof, now I'm thinking about my brand as well. So my brand is to walk upon roofs because I'm trained to do so, not required. I put those images in my inspection report. I put those images on my website and I make sure that um, people know my brand, why they should hire me, why I'm the best, because I carry a 40 foot aluminum, 32 foot fiberglass, 28 foot fiberglass, 12 foot aluminum, step ladder and a crawl gear. And I take close up pictures too. So that's my hand touching things. And when somebody reviews my inspection report, they can, they understand who I am, what my company does, and they can really make a um, decision about whether they should hire me or not based upon my inspection report. So that's why certain images are really important. This one's a great one. So the skylights were not installed properly. They probably leaked in the past. The flashing is not properly done. Actually, I don't see flashing in certain areas. Let's see if I can hook us up with uh, drawing on the screen. So it's missing flashing there. I should see flashing, I should see step flashing. Um, this is the counter flashing incorporated into the window system itself. But the step flashing should be there and it's not. And what's in its place is what? The tar roof sealant, it's like a Band-Aid. Great, I have an apron flashing, but nothing else. Nice copper flashing. I may see some continuous flashing underneath, some step flashing. I don't know. Something's going on. Whenever I see a Band-Aid, I take a picture of it, a video of it, and I tell my client, this is a Band-Aid patch. Just like a Band-Aid is going to fall off and not work anymore. But the roof isn't going to heal itself. So it's a temporary kind of Band-Aid patch. And to understand more about skylights, it's a penetration through the roof covering. Um, we have um, articles. Let's bring this over that you may be interested in. And courses, obviously, training courses for how to inspect the roof. But also, you want to beef up your inspection report all the time, making it better. And you can throw in illustrations like this. So InterNACHI has an online library of graphics and illustrations free to members to use, for members to use in their inspection reports. And um, this isn't a picture of a, a skylight, but you can get one for of a skylight. This is a chimney flashing. We're, gonna, we're going to inspect some chimneys. And basically, you, you want to identify the, the components. So when you're talking to your client about the apron flashing or the step flashing, you, Illustrations can help you. It's like a, taking a picture. It's worth a thousand words. Illustration is the same thing. But you have to get the terminology right. So for me, it's easy to remember. Um, the flashing around a skylight or a chimney is basically the same. You have the head flashing. You have to think about the roof. So if the roof is coming above you, right behind you, coming down, uh, the flashing at the back of your head is the head flashing. Um, the flashing in the front of you is like an apron. Apron flashing is like if you wear an apron, it's on the front of you, it's down, down and out. Head flashing, apron flashing. Step flashing is on the side, and you have the counter flashing covering it. And that's basically it. If you talk to your clients with the right terminology, you sound really intelligent. And then you can um, improve your inspection reports with those free graphics from our graphics library. And it's at natchi.org forward slash gallery. Um, taking pictures of the, the gutters, because now I'm thinking about how water moves. Um, this is in Pennsylvania. I did this inspection. We call it Pennsylvania. So there's a lot of water um, being collected <clears throat> and diverted off the roof. It's collected in the gutters. How are the gutters collecting the um, the runoff, and then I'm going to go and I'm going to think about, uh, continue with my inspection and think about how that water is collected, drain down the downspouts, and divert it away from the foundation. But along the way, when the roof plane meets something else that's an intersection, I want flashing there. 
I don't want a lot of sealant like this. This is a lot of sealant here. That's a Band-Aid patch, and that's no good. Not sure what's going on. I often write in my inspection report to my client to ask the seller about prior leaks, because we all know this is what happens when there is a prior leak. Somebody goes up there and does this patch work. I see step flashing, but it might not be installed properly. I see step flashing there with a little bit of a counter flash coming out, extended out. So I kind of lift the siding because I want to see what's going on. And I'm not afraid of adding those photos to my inspection report. I actually give all of my photos, images, and video to my clients so I'm taking pictures. Uh, let's see. So you can have uh, another image in your report about kickouts. Kickouts are really important. Kickouts literally kick out the water away from a wall intersection, typically where the gutter end meets the wall. More pictures, more pictures. I don't see anything wrong with the roof. It's aged. I estimate the age. It has ventilation. This is a um, sewer stack pipe with a lot of flashing problems, uh, just coated with tar. The chimney has had problems in the past. Uh, I think uh, the counter flashing wasn't installed on this chimney. Somebody got a piece of aluminum siding and glued it to the chimney. So this is unreliable, non-standard, will ultimately fail. Uh, the roof areas are ventilated. The attic spaces, unconditioned attic spaces on the roof are ventilated. There we have some loose siding problems. Um, parts of the siding have fallen off. This is aluminum siding. Someone's nailed it up, um, but it's not done very well and it needs to be sealed. Um, there's a metal material on the rear porch roof. Um, all of those little black dots are black roof tar material on top of the fasteners. The fasteners should have a gasket of some kind, maybe a weather resistant, water resistant type of material. <clears throat> and those fasteners want to be, they want to be down and secured. You want to see them secured. We have a problem with this one, or at least an issue, a concern, because everything has been touched up with some um, roof sealant. And again, that's not permanent. So when I'm down on the ground, I think I'll get a better picture of that condition. Um, there's a cable coming into the house with an electric line, a loose electric line to a spotlight in the back, and that is a hazard. Um, the line is um, a UF, it's for exterior use, but it's, it's not installed properly. It's a bit of a hazard, electrical hazard. Then I get to the chimney stacks. There's one. I know this is not a fireplace stack because it's too small. The diameter is just too small. Um, this is a heating system chimney stack, masonry chimney stack. Um, the flues for heating systems are typically square. Fireplaces are typically, the throat is rectangular. Um, this one has problems because of obvious cracking. Um, so that could be a, a, a moisture problem. Um, it's absorbed moisture. It's frozen in the wintertime, overheating, um, some settling. Could be a lot of problems. Deterioration, I see it on the outside. So again, you don't have to take the, you don't have to inspect the flue of any chimney stack, but I take a picture. When I do, I tend to find things that help my client. So I take the cap off the screen, the rain cap, the screen off, and I take my digital picture of the flue right down. And if I don't see anything obvious, I typically just, pass on by, don't say anything. I don't say that the flu is in good shape or it was inspected or even suggest that I was inspecting the flu. However, if I do see a problem with my eyes and my camera, I'm going to, and I do, I'm gonna tell my client. So may not be see, may not be able to see it now, but um, there are actual um, holes, cracks, uh, openings in the interior flu liner. Um, and that's a major issue, major defect right there, there's actually pieces falling out. Um, and we'll take a look at that. The flashing um, is in poor shape, um, really bad installation, uh, non not standard. 
insulation. So it's not reliable. I like to say it's not reliable. Just in case a future condition happens, I can tell my client, well, in the report, remember I said it, this is not reliable, which means you can't rely on it. Anything could happen. Fireplace, exterior is okay. The crown or the wash, whatever you want to call it, the top part that diverts water off the top of the chimney stack um, is cracked in poor shape, worn out. And then this is an awesome thing. That's creosote. Shiny black stuff on a fireplace flue component is creosote, and that's a fire hazard. I'm not sure what they're burning. Green wood, um, tires. It's pretty incredible that this hasn't caught on fire. So it's, um, it's eminent. I'll use that word as well. It's going to happen. If you start a fire in this fireplace, something really bad is going gonna, gonna to turn into a torch. And I've seen that. I've tried to put those types of fires out. Um, you can even see this just clogged with stuff. This is an easy defect that you can find, any home inspector can find, from the ground with binoculars or a spectroscope. Um, but I just thought you would enjoy seeing the it's, it's incredible amount of shiny black creosote. That's a great picture. Okay, so to understand more about uh, fireplaces or creosote issues, we have a lot of inspection articles in our library, a huge online free library to inspectors, thousands of articles. And um, you, for example, this one, Fireplace Fuel, written by my bro. Or you can take a course, a free online course about how to inspect fireplaces, stoves, and chimneys. And click the green button. And if you're a member, you go right in. And I like this course because we have a bunch of images of defects and problems within the course um, with descriptions. And you can zoom in a little bit. So there's a missing kick out flashing we mentioned earlier. So if you feel weak in one area, for example, inspecting fireplaces or inspecting flashing problems, We've got you covered. So you find out your weakness. If you feel not that confident in performing a certain type of inspection of a, of a system, InterNACHI has the inspection gallery illustrations, inspection library of articles, and an entire curriculum to support you. Um, this fireplace chimney stack, the flashing, the counter flashing is missing. You can see the step flashing, some tar, Something may have been torn off. I just don't understand how this could get by with a, um, a relatively new roof. This is not an original roof. So I think the roofer and the homeowner just didn't communicate very well. No counter flashing. And so you can pull the step flashing away from the chimney stack and allow water to go right in. So when, when I'm thinking about inspecting um, the rest of the house, I'm going to be in the attic in that area and I'm going to look for water damage. Um, right there, I'm actually going to put my foot right on top of the step flashing and see if it feels weak, the sheathing or the deck material. Um, and I know that a house is a system of interdependent parts. You affect one part and it affects many others. This component is missing. The counter flashing component is missing on the step flashing system, the flashing system around the chimney. It's going to affect many other components and systems of the house. So that's a concept you should have in mind. That while you're inspecting, you're not just inspecting one thing, and it's exclusive or regardless of anything else. It's really, it's really complicated. You know, things affect all other things. Yeah. You know? uh, chimney cleanout. It's in good shape. A lot of soot streaking down the chimney stack. Um, this is the roof of the. Um, detached garage. And I think they built it after the house was built and they tucked it under the overhead electrical line. That's the main electrical line. And it is touching not only the uh, trees, right? But it's in contact with the roof. Man, is that just a fire hazard right there? So I know that this is not right um, because of many things. Our training helps you that, but also we have some illustrations. So it needs, 
needs to be, there's a, a clearance, a minimum clearance of an electric line um, over uh, a structure or a sidewalk or a road or a swimming pool. And the flatter the roof, the higher the clearance, right? It makes sense. Someone's going to stand on a flat roof. So that's a, a major defect. Safety hazard. Could cause a fire. Could really hurt someone. If you are weak on roof systems, inspecting roof systems, we have a huge list of free online courses to members. Take a look at that. Now I'm on the ground and I'm thinking about how water moves, right? The roof diverts the water into the gutters, gutters divert the water into the downspouts, downspouts divert the water, hopefully away from the foundation. But if there's a hard surface, I'm, I'm checking that one out. There's a downspout diverting water away from the foundation or the porch and the hard surfaces must be sloped away slightly. And I'm taking a look at stoops, steps, driveways, walkways. And while I'm inspecting the exterior like that, I'm inspecting all systems. So I come across this. So for you folks in warm climates, you have no idea what this is. Um, this is really a northeastern anomaly. <laughs> this is a fill pipe and a vent pipe. Um, there's the vent. So a fill pipe is for an oil um, tank that's in the house. Um, they could be buried in the ground. They don't do that anymore. Um, it's been a while since they've done that. Um, they pulled many old ones out. Um, I found many buried oil tanks in the ground. Um, it was a really difficult sale for the real estate agent. Um, this one is a problem because the fill pipe is higher than the vent pipe. Vent pipe is actually like a whistle. You dump oil into the fill pipe that goes into the tank. The tank displaces air, fills up with oil, displaces air, pushes the air out, and it comes out of the vent. There's the window there. Um, no um, Interior electric line used for the outside receptacle, uh, no GFCI. So we have the discharge of the sump pump at the bottom of the picture. So now I know that there's a sump pump in the basement and it's wet there. So I know that we have um, potential water intrusion issues. And then some shingle tabs are kind of loose, no big deal. Taking a look at anything near an opening like a window. So when this snows or rains, there's a lot of splash because there's a hard surface right next to a window. There's no clearance. So I want to take a look at that. Um, no frost-free hose bibs on the outside. Missing handrail. Technically, there's a handrail on the right, right? That wooden structure there to grab onto. But my grandmother would have a problem with the first two steps because there's nothing to hold onto. So take a look at the, the bottom corners and top corners of every window and door. So this is the rear slider door. I take, when I come up to a door on the exterior, I look top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And I tend to find things like this on an older slider door component. Um, it has wood rot and peeling paint at the corners right there. So some structural issues, some patching is needed. No big deal. Uh, there's the rear porch roof, right? And there's a lot of nails that are popping out. So we've got this nail here, it's popping up. This nail here is popping up. This nail net head here is popping up. Maybe that's what they, maybe that was the problem that they were having, right? It just wasn't installed right. There's a nail head there. And the roof is sagging. So this is the um, thin, maybe quarter inch plywood sheathing um, secured to the bottom of the porch roof. And you can see it's kind of like sagging like that. So this is sagging, actually. So something's going on there. But as you can see, there's nothing uh, that I skip. Um, and I try to keep it all in your head, right? Veterans, we can keep it all in our heads. So while we're moving down and around, we know that things are connected to one another. Um, we know we have a problem with the roof on the top, and we have structural uh, sheathing sagging at the bottom. So those two are connected. And then the structural components. I want to take a look at how that 
rear porch roof is held up. So I take a look at the corners, right? The load bearing components. I'm looking for anything and I see water. So there's water streaming down here, or at least water marks. Um, the house is being sold. They typically paint these things, um, leaving it, um, it maybe old or recent. I'm not sure. Um, you can use your infrared <laughs> camera to confirm that you're seeing something wet. Uh, I would just use a, a moisture meter um, or um, everyone has a really great tool to use. All home inspectors have this tool. Uh, you never leave home without it. It's one of the most sensitive tools to detect moisture. Excuse me. It's your hand. So feel free to use your hands <laughs> during the inspection to see if something's wet. Um, it can also uh, help you find um, air leakage spots. Um, so I'm really just taking a lot of pictures. These are inspection restrictions. If I ever need to explain why I didn't see everything. And I'm um, not sure what that is. Later on, um, I'll connect it to the stove in the basement. So it's actually uh, a little propane stove kind of system going on there. Not installed very well. Kind of hazardous. Uh, if somebody kicks the stool, you'll then have a gas leak. A few other cosmetic issues. No big deal. Dryer hood is cracked. Exterior looks pretty good. Here's the air conditioner unit. There's the line going up. The refrigerant lines, suction line, liquid line, go up into the attic. They make it look like a downspout. Um, that's nice. But there's the air conditioner. So it was installed after the house was built. It's in the attic, typically on an older existing home like this one, 45 years old. Um, when you install an air conditioner after that, um, typically not all the rooms will be conditioned with the air conditioner. So I'll just put that in my report, but I'll confirm it. Um, and it was true in this house. So basically you had a bunch of supplies in the top sections of the house and the cool air just dropped down. Shut off switch, it's a Kenmore. And I wanted to show you a cool thing. Somebody asked me, how do I um, age a unit? And I'm not sure if you know this one, there's a little trick. Go to www.buildingcenter.org buildingcenter.org and you click this button for HVAC equipment um, they have one for heaters as well and you look up the manufacturer and this one is Kenmore and uh, let's go back to the image so here's my serial number for the unit L97062787 um, and it's this style for Kenmore I have my L, right? It's not an H or the other ones. So right here, it tells you if it's this style, then the first two years, um, first two numbers is the year, and the second two is the week. So over here, um, the serial number on the air conditioner of the Kenmore on the property I'm inspecting was um, manufactured in 1997. So that's an easy way to age the unit if you're interested in doing that not required to. So there's the electrical line uh, going into the meter. Um, nice square box. Um, it's not 200 amp. It's um, maybe 150, 100 amp. Let's say I don't can't tell on the outside. It's not labeled or something. Um, on the inside at the main electrical panel, I'll take a look at the shutoff switch. Oh, and in this house, shutoff switches are in the uh, inside. Main shutoff switch, main electrical panels on the inside of the house. Um, Many states, all of that stuff, equipment, is on the outside. Um, the garage, detached garage with the electrical line, remember, too close to the roof? I'll take a look at that. Um, newer garage door openers, installed well, safety eyes, but they're plugged in with an extension cord. Ideally, you want it um, plugged into a receptacle uh, right next to the opener so it's not reliable. And there's no GFCI protection. And there's no sub panel in the garage. The structure looks fine. The floor is sloped. The wooden structure of the roof looks very good. No problems or complaints there. Um, a lot of inspection restrictions. I take a picture of it. Um, if you wanted to know more about inspecting our garage, we actually have an awesome video with Internachi's Kenton Shepherd, 
Um, it's a just a short video. It's not really a course. Um, and he goes through the processes and tips of inspecting a garage roof. Oh, I'm sorry, inspecting a, um, a garage from the inside, including the garage door. So you can take a look at that. That make the concrete a little thinner, and since it's thinner, that's where it's weaker, and that's where it will crack. And if you look here, you can see that these control joints have done their job. Yep. Thanks, Kenton. Um, and if you wanted to um, learn more about inspecting the exterior, we have a ton of courses on our education page, natural.org forward slash education. Let's get to the boiler. Um, or let's see, anybody have any questions? Um, John says he doesn't like the FLIR one because it doesn't have a temperature range. Yep. Um, let's see. Just going through the pictures. People are having problems um, with sound and with images. Um, just log back, log out, and log back in. Click the link in the email and log back in, and that typically does it. Not sure why that's a, a fix or a workaround, but it, it always works. Um, Sky asks, how do you go about inspecting a roof when there's a ton of snow on the roof? Um, I don't inspect the roof uh, at all when there's snow. Um, I once uh, used to bring a broom and broom it off. I really can't see anything. And um, I, I want to give, I want to show my client I gave some effort, and I think you can do that. Um, maybe go up and brush it off with your hand, um, look for records, permits, ask the seller for information. Um, I typically had to come back, and that was just part of the cost of doing a, a great home inspection. Sometimes during the winter, um, there are additional travel. There's additional travel time and you got to come back when the roof is covered with snow, particularly a flat roof. Um, it's hard to see anything on a flat roof um, when it's covered with snow and ice. So uh, I just incorporated that into my like overhead. Uh, I don't see... No, no, no. Can't see it. Okay. All right. So if you're having problems, um, make sure that you log out and log back in. Okay. Can the rest of you all hear me? I hope you can. We'll continue with the boiler. Um, not all of you ever get to see an oil-fired boiler, but this is it. It's basically a box made out of cast iron, and um, the cast iron pieces are filled with water, and a burner burning oil shoots flames into that chamber of cast iron filled with water, heats it up to almost boiling temperature, and then there's a pump and it circulates that hot water around the house. And the hot water goes through radiators and it radiates out heat. So basically that's it. And there's um, water being heated. Um, we have to be concerned with temperature and pressure. So there's a temperature pressure relief there. Um, there's a shutoff switch for service. There's the pump to circulate the hot water throughout the house. There's the burner. Um, the Oil line is coming from the right into a filter. Um, the burner turns that oil into a mist pssst, and ignites it. Pssst, and flames shoot into a chamber. There's some red, hot, uh, orange, red flames. It sounds like a rumbling sound, like that, when the burner is on. There is pressure and temperature gauges. Um, there are controls to control the, the temperature of the water. Um, there's the oil line coming from the t oil tank. There's the flue pipe going into the chimney with a draft. Um, there's a pressure tank, um, an expansion tank. When you heat up water, it tends to expand, and uh, this absorbs that pressure. And there's um, water coming in, potable water, coming into the boiler. We don't want that boiler water to get back into the system, into the house. And the hot water is generated from the boiler itself. So cold water goes into a coil into the boiler and comes out of the boiler scalding hot. And there should be a, a valve in between the hot and cold to control, temper the hot water so that it's not scalding when it comes to the fixtures. And we have a lot of courses on how to 
inspect the heating and cooling system. Um, that's the oil storage tank with the oil and fill pipe, oil fill pipe and vent pipe that we saw on the outside. There's a gauge on top of the tank. There's a shutoff valve. Um, the belly of these oil tanks um, rust first because they're typically in a crawl space or uh, a, ba a basement. It's an old system, old method of, of heating your home, having storage tanks. Oil. They're kind of phasing that out um, unless it's a high efficiency heating system. And so um, these tanks are a lot of fun to inspect. The belly of the tank is rusty. I get my screwdriver out. I tap it. The legs are simple pipes, um, cast iron pipes, iron pipes. And they tend to sit on something like concrete and it gets wet and rusty. And um, I've actually had tanks that are just floating and you can just pu push them over and uh, it'd be an oil spill in the basement. But this one's okay. Uh, next to the oil tank is the water supply coming in. So there's the water supply, water meter, jumper cable, water shutoff valve. It's not leaking. And below the water meter is the sump pump. Remember that pump we saw, discharge pipe by the downspout we saw at the corner of the house? Well, here's the sump pump. It's dry. Two good things. And it's supported well. And it's relatively new. The flexible pipe is okay. I like to see solid pipe. The flexible pipe tends to wiggle a lot and um, come apart. And then there's um, a finished basement. Um, some of the windows were blocked with curtains and some walls were put up and some funky things were going on. I didn't understand it, so I poked my nose around and in and I found that they were hanging ham. <laughs> so you never know what you come across. And they also had a lot of moonshine. Then I realized what I'm standing in. This is, you know, a really neat basement where they're making food, drying meat, and um, bottling. Uh, look like wine. So that was cool. Um, the basement pictures help me um, if I ever need help describing the inspection restrictions. So I don't move refrigerators. I don't look behind finished walls. There's a lot of storage around and I don't move anything. The standards of practice says that I don't move personal items in order to perform my inspection. I just don't, I don't move them. So I don't move the bottle, uh, the five gallon glass bottle of wine in order to look at the water problems. But we do have water problems. These are um, concrete masonry units. Um, they're like sponges, especially if there is no drainage on the outside or parging or waterproofing. They absorb moisture, they wick it, and they bring it out through. And sometimes you'll see efflorescence on the inside where there's those salt deposits, that white stuff. So there's a, a great need for a moisture meter right there to confirm what's going on, um, but a picture tells a thousand words. And there's another sump pump. So we have two sump pump holes in this basement, and it looks like this one was, well, they're both retroactively installed after the house was built. You can tell by the concrete and a couple other things. That's a modern kind of container. Um, this one doesn't have a sump pump there, but maybe there was a need. So I'm going to tell my client, something's going on with the basement. It's probably a lot of water moisture intrusion problems. They have a sump pump that's active. They have another one ready to go. Um, and the ceiling of the basement is sagging. Something above us leaked in the past. But the structure looks pretty good. I don't see any, anything wrong. And we have a lot of structural courses if you're interested. Electrical. Remember the meter on the outside, square, meter, line, line overhead, conductors too close to the detached garage? Well, it comes in here, and here's the main panel. And I take a picture like this because I want to make sure the, of the position of the breakers or, or the, the look of the fuses. I want to make sure that um, everything's on or off, labeled. If the, something is off, is it tripped off, which could be a hazard. If you reset it, don't ever reset a breaker whether it's been tripped or turned off. And um, has it been tur manually turned off? Um, you do not have to remove dead front covers. Um, I would say it's very dangerous. I've heard stories. There's not a lot of high voltage here, but things can spark and, and surprise the heck out of you. And I've done that. And um, so you wear gloves, safety glasses, and um, 
if you're going to do anything. You're not required to remove the dead front cover, although I do. Um, if it's 200 amps, I'll use two fingers in my picture. Um, if it's 100 amps, 150, bend the second finger. So this is only a 100 amp electrical panel. Um, that's the main de um, that's the main disconnect. I don't know how they survived on 100 amps and with an air conditioner. Um, this one might be the air conditioner unit. That's the disconnect. That's the breaker, but it's labeled above. So I'm not sure where these lines are going. They're they're not labeled very well. I'm not sure if it's even accurate. And I know that there's an electric stove somewhere too when I came in. Um, I take a picture of the latest um, inspection date. Um, so nothing in the basement was uh, permitted or anything. And there's the inside. Um, looks okay. There's that breaker I'm concerned with. Could be a stove. Um, but here is a double tap. This always gets my attention when I have two wires going into a breaker designed to hold one. Two wires going into a breaker designed to hold one. And this gauge wire is different from this gauge wire. And I think this is a 10 gauge wire to a 30 amp breaker. And this is a 14 gauge wire. Now, how do I know that's wrong? Well, code tells you everything. We're not code inspectors, but you can refer to code. Or you can refer to your Internet sheet course, which refers to code for you. And this table in our electrical, um, how to perform electrical inspections, online free course for members, um, has a table and it shows the most common conductor sizes um, in residential um, branch circuits, along with the maximum permitted breaker or fuse size. So um, I have a in that in that panel there at that breaker, I have a 10 gauge on a 30 amp, great. But I have also a 14 gauge double tapped, and the maximum size for a 14 gauge is 15 amps. So we have an electrical problem there that needs to be addressed by a master electrician. Um, I don't say, I try not to say contractor, a licensed electrician. All the other breakers are, I don't see anything wrong. Older wiring, and there's that double tap, yep. Uh, fireplace, remember the creosote at the top? Well, here's the fireplace that's causing all that. Um, they're not using it anymore because there's damage at the back wall. You can see the bricks are damaged and cracked and it's really a hazard. The metal material is warped. Um, high excessive heat going on. It's actually warped. The, the heat inside this fireplace insert got so hot it melted metal. Um, so that's a fire hazard if it's used again for two reasons. One, this condition of that insert, right? It's a fireplace insert. It's a it's a metal box slid into a fireplace opening. Um, and uh, the crease up. So this is the basement half bath toilet sink. Run the water. There's the sewer lines. No clean out. Can't find it. Can't really see what's going on. The ceiling in the bathroom um, has a patch from something that happened in the past. In this house, um, there's a like a kitchenette, kitchen area downstairs. Um, with a gas stove. Remember the propane tank on the outside? It, it's going into here. Um, this is a hazard because of um, this. So it's a combustible wall right next to um, gas burners. So this is about, I don't know, six inches. You put a pot there, and the flames are going to just melt that wall. And it has, actually. So there's discoloration and scorching on this um, material next to the stove. Uh, let's see, where are we? Clothes washer next to the bathroom, um, next to the kitchen sink down in the, in the basement. Um, it's plugged in with an extension cord. That's a defect. Every time I come to a laundry area, I stick my nose over the top of the laundry, over top of the dryer or washer. And I see what's going on down there. It's some really interesting stuff. So that's a, a little tip. So you can't have an extension cord. For a clothes washer. The hoses are great, stainless steel braided mesh, but they're connected to the to the um, to the supply line underneath the, the kitchen sink. Remember that kitchen sink right next to the clothes washer? It's not supported, so these lines are actually gonna break off 
and the clothes washer just discharges into the kitchen sink. Um, and that could be a problem because that sink is not um, draining well. It's probably clogged. And it's, a, um, it's an S-trap. You want a P-trap. And a P-trap looks like that. And we call it a P-trap because it looks like a P. There's the, the letter P right there. An S-trap looks like an S. And it loops around. kind of looks like this. Sorry, I can't draw. There, right? Oh, it could be a Z. Um, so how did I find this problem? Well, there's the system. And then I want to find the components to the system. So I look around. I look in the back. There's a defect. Um, there's the defect. There's a, a component that's in good shape, but that's the defect. So you follow the water supply, especially if, uh, if it's a system with water supplied to it or water draining from it, follow the flow of water or follow the flow of electricity, where it's connected. There's the discharge and there's the sink and there's the bad trap and there's the valves coming in. Can't get to the valves to work on them. There's the dryer. The dryer is another system. You look around it, behind it, and it's hardwired. So you can't unplug the dryer. Um, that's probably one of the breakers from the panel connected to it. It's not identified. And we have an old three-pronged dryer receptacle there. Um, another component of a system would be the air conditioner. Remember, we saw the air conditioner on the outside. We used that link to get to the date. We could date the air conditioner. It's retroactively installed. Um, um, it was installed after the home was built, sorry. Um, the disposable air filter is dirty, and it's in a closet. To get to the air conditioner system that's in the attic, we know it's in the attic because we follow the refrigerant line from the condenser on the outside, compressor on the outside. Um, that door to the attic is not sealed, it's not insulated. So it's a huge heat loss. It, this house bleeds energy which means my client is going to have really high heating and cooling and operating costs. Um, I know that because I'm a home energy score assessor, right? That's what I want you to be, a home energy score assessor or a home energy inspector. This is the bathroom exhaust, exhausting into the attic, not installed very well, not sealed, not insulated, electrical hazards, and I know this is a problem because I was trained by InterNACHI and I read this inspection article about how to inspect the bathroom exhaust. And um, exhaust, uh, bathroom exhausts really need to go outside for one thing. Um, they can't exhaust into the attic space and it should be sealed up. You shouldn't have any missing insulation around it and it should be insulated and sealed with like a rigid foam box with all the seams taped and sealed around the edges. So it's energy efficient. Um, there's the air conditioner unit. Electrical disconnect, service switch, nice. It's suspended well, supported well. No problems with condensate. Has a nice catch pan underneath. The drainage system is okay. It's not supported very well, but it's okay. The ductwork isn't installed very well. It's loose there. I'm missing a part of it. It's not really sealed well. Um, let's see. And kind of picky on the ductwork. Um, this strap is really restricting the ducts, right? Because um, they're hanging here, but they're cutting in. So this, this strap actually cuts in about halfway. This one, too, cuts in about halfway. So you restrict the... It looks like it's nice and thick and round, but it's actually restricted. Um, it's kinked. It's bent. So it's not supported well at all. Um, and it's forcing the unit to work harder to condition the air. Um, this ductwork is has been chewed up by something. That's how I phrase it. I don't want to say that I've inspected mice, that I can identify mice or infestation or squirrels or anything, but it's been chewed up. Um, it's been torn apart. Um, and... ICC, International Code Council, has done something pretty amazing. Good for them. They put their codes online. So if you click that link, remember the slides I'm going to give you on our webinar page. 
Um, the 2015 codes are here, and they're all uh, online and available. So here's the um, IBC, National Building Code, um, the International Mechanical Code, the Mechanical Code is one of the ones I like to read, uh, Energy Conservation Code is a good one, the ECC, and here's um, International Bases most, if not all, of its training on the IRC, International Residential Code. And um, uh, let's not open that one. Let's go, let's open the um, International Mechanical Code, right? And you can go to Chapter 6, Duct Systems. And um, if you do a little search for the word mastic, you get to um, a section called Joints, Seams, and Connections. And you can talk about how um, the ductwork is supposed to be connected to one another um, and secured and sealed and labeled um, all the joints um, and seams and connections should be fastened and sealed together well um, and you're not a code inspector but when you take a look at ductwork that isn't um, installed properly you can then use code as a foundation upon which to make your um, suggestions, recommendations, and to guide your inspection and to help write your report. So the structure is in pretty good shape. Actually, new sheathing um, it was installed. So the old sheathing was replaced and new sheathing was installed. But that is a shot of the fiberglass insulation. The vapor retarder um, is installed on the wrong side um, for cold climates. It should be installed with the warm side. Um, and it's only about three inches thick, and it's in really poor condition. Um, a lot of energy loss here, a lot of energy issues, missing insulation. Um, not sure why there's missing insulation on the walls. Um, the ductwork was installed, and so the contractors moved the existing insulation, installed the ductwork, and never reinstalled the insulation. So it's really poor condition. A lot of things need to be fixed up there. And so I highly recommend becoming a home energy score assessor. If you're in the United States, this is for US inspectors only. Become a home energy score assessor. The training is incredible. Really great training about um, insulation, but also systems, because every system has an energy efficiency um, rating, and like heating and cooling I'm talking about. So it helps you. Uh, remember how we calculated the age of the Kenmore air conditioner? Well, that's available. Um, that tool is available um, when you um, become a home energy score assessor. And also, there's another thing I like to use. There's a web page. This is our home energy score web page. You can take a look at the videos, and it shows you how to become a home energy um, score assessor. And we also have marketing as well. So we made um, door hangers and flyers. There's actually um, some handouts um, that are downloadable um, from your GoToWebinar control panel there. So you can, there's a couple links under the handouts. So if you look at your bottom right, um, you can see the handouts there. So you can download those to become a home energy score assessor. And then there's something else. There's a calculator. Let's see if I can get it to pop up. So this comes with the training for becoming a home energy score assessor as for member um, members in the US only. So let's say you have, um, it's really cool to think about this. So I'm in the attic and I say, um, I'm looking at the attic floor and it's about 10 inches, 12 inches thick, fiberglass bad insulation. So I know the R value of that is 30 and 100% um, of it is covered. So that's great. My assembly R value, the entire attic floor the weighted average, the effective value of the insulation is R30, right? 100%. And it's installed well. Let's say um, not all of it has insulation, only 95% of it, oh, most of it, 95% of it. But one area, like let's say it's the attic access. Remember the attic door uh, was not insulated? Maybe it's a attic scuttle hatch in the ceiling of a second floor bedroom closet. Um, it represents about 5% and there's zero R value. Well, the effective rate 
the assembly R value is now 12. It was 30 if it was covered by 100%, right? The entire floor, 100% of the entire floor was in good condition, R30 value, that's the, but if you have an access to that attic space, and it represents only 5% of the entire floor area, but it's not insulated at all, the R value, effective R value, the weighted average R value is actually less than half, it's only R12. That's how important insulation is. That's how important air leakage and insulation is. Homes are bleeding energy like crazy. All over the United States, we build our, our housing stock is about 30, 40 years old, built in around 1980 or so, without any regard to energy efficiency. And they're losing energy, bleeding energy, right out the top, typically, out of air leakage, mainly. And so this is a great opportunity. We're, we're inspecting homes every day, and we can make recommendations, intelligent ones. Um, you shouldn't say this is R30 value when the attic access is not insulated. The effective R value is much less than that. So you have to um, speak intelligently about the things that you are inspecting. One of the great opportunities is a home inspector should understand energy efficiency or energy deficiencies in a home. There's a lot of opportunities to educate your clients and add value to your home inspection service by talking about things that cost your client a lot of money, and that's energy inefficiencies or deficiencies. Yeah, so that's one of the tools. It's a, it's a, a really nice. Well, there's a few other things I could show you, kind of, tr kind of um, some tricks that you could use during your inspection. But become a home energy score assessor. If you don't know how, contact us on our contact page. So let's uh, let's finish up. We only have a few minutes left. What I do is once I get done with the big systems. Roof, exterior, basement, heating, cooling, plumbing, hot water source, electrical. Then I do the attic. I come out of the attic, and I'm basically reaching the, the kitchen as fast as I can. I do the interior and the bathrooms. They're pretty easy. I go down. If there's something in the interior that's specific, uh, another fireplace maybe, I'll inspect that. But I'm heading to the kitchen where I have set up my computer, my printer, and... Um, I'm ready to go. So I'm just going to blow through these. I'm looking for GFCIs, water leaks. I'm making sure the hot and cold turn on. Um, this is a scalding issue. If it's a hot and cold on an older home, you have hot and cold handles, but you should have one with anti scald features. Um, a lot of opportunities to educate your client about things. Uh, carpeting should not be installed in the bathroom. If it is, um, lift it up and see what's underneath. It's not that sanitary. Those carpets can be kind of nasty. Um, where are we? So we're doing the interior, taking pictures of the interior, checking the receptacles, older home, two-prong receptacles. Not a big deal. The ceilings, the doors, the windows. I look for signs of water, especially on um, slab foundations. Receptacles are in good shape. Open and close the windows. There's the bay window. The bay window ceiling typically has watermarks um, when the roof has failed. So I take a look at that. Remember, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And I'm doing good. Uh, the skylights have watermarks on them. You can't see them in the picture, but the bottom corners have water streaks on the, uh, the drywall. So that's not a good thing. That's what we saw on the roof, remember? with the tar patching. Uh, remember that slider door on the outside? Well, I want to take a look at watermarks on the inside. I want to see if the flooring is bad. I want to see if the, the structure of the door itself, the frame, is in good shape or not. Not all rooms have conditioned air. This is the main house supply. So I'm not sure if this air conditioner was installed properly at all. And there's the kitchen, the main kitchen on the first floor. Run water, GFCIs, dishwasher, stove, and the kitchen exhaust should go outside. And we have um, one more URL to go through, and that's the home energy score. I highly recommend, this is for US members only, I highly recommend you becoming a home energy score assessor so you can score every home 
But if you don't want to score every home, don't want to score a home, do the training. The training is amazing, and it's all online. Um, it's actually a 3D. You become um, an avatar. You move your avatar through a home in 3D um, simulation, and you perform an inspection. It's really awesome. Uh, the slides, I'm going to throw in all these links. Take a look at them. Uh, we reviewed them during the uh, webinar itself about where to find the inspection pictures, the articles. And um, if you need anything, this is our contact page, natchi.org forward slash contact, and a few other URLs. The one that I really like is natchi.org forward slash everything. If you're looking for something to really boost your business, go to that page. It's a 15-step by step checklist on running a successful home inspection company. Uh, my name is Ben Gramico. I'm from Internachi. I'll see you next time. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye.